Good morning and welcome to the service of Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church. Good you're able to join today and hope that you enjoy worshipping God together and that you're blessed as we come under his word. I'm Jeremy, I'm the minister of Dunfermline Free Church and it's good to be able to share with you today. We're also joined today by the folks from Nairn Free Church, their minister Murdo's on holiday and so they are uh, listening in today. Uh, sharing it on their own YouTube channel. So we're glad that even though things aren't the way we want to uh, have them, we can still be together and worship God in this way. I want to start our worship this morning uh, listening to praise from Psalm 139. Perhaps you can sing along if you know it or if the words come up. O Lord, thou hast me searched and known. Thou knowest my sitting down and rising up. Yea, all my thoughts afar to thee or no. Today we're going to be thinking about God's plan and God having a plan for us. And so it's great for us to know as we come to God that he knows us through and through. And so we rejoice to worship him now. Let's listen to Psalm 139. Let's join together now in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time when we can come and worship you together as a church. Amund and Fernland, some folks are in Dingwall or Nairn, but we are a church. We are the people of God. We are your people uh, scattered just throughout Scotland in this instance, but we thank you that we can come together and that we have this shared hope that you are there, that you are hearing us, that you are helping us, and that worshipping you is what you want us to do today. So we worship you today for your goodness, for your greatness. We worship you because you are the powerful God. We worship you because, as we're thinking this morning, you're the God who knows the beginning and the end. And you're the God who has so designed things that we will have no end, but we will be with you forever and forever in your heavenly city in your new heavens and your new earth. 
We thank you, Lord, that you've made it possible for us to come to you through Jesus, that we can be forgiven for our sin and accepted as your children, as heirs of all that you've given us, all that you have uh, planned for us. We thank you that we can have that through Christ Jesus. We acknowledge before you that we still do wrong, we're still sinners, but we thank you that we can come and by confessing our sin, we come before the God who is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for your cleansing power. Thank you for this blood that has been shed for us on Calvary. And we come to you asking, O oh Lord, that as we think of Christ giving himself for us, that we would be willing to live for you now. As he suffered for us, we pray that we'd be willing to go through trials and suffering for him. We ask a blessing on your word today. Be with each one who hears it in their home or wherever they are. We ask, O oh Lord, that uh, you would encourage us and that you'd strengthen us. We pray for any who are watching and who don't yet know you. We ask, O oh Lord, that they would come to know you, that you would work in their hearts and make them your own. So be with us. Bless your word that we'll read in a few moments and help us as we worship you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to talk to the boys and girls now. I know that lots of us have made plans. I wonder what your plans have been over the last few months. Did you have a good Easter holiday? Did you have a good end of term at school? No, you didn't really, did you? Because all of these things have got, well, the plans that we had, they didn't come to anything. I've got here a calendar I stole from one of my boys' bedrooms and if, if, I, if I look at this calendar, I think everything was going well until February. And then in March, we had to start staying at home and not going to school. In April, in this week in April, I was going to have a great holiday. But I had to stay at home. And in this week in May, I was going to go for a big cycle with my friends. And I had to stay at home. And now we've got through June, we're past June, and we're in the summer holidays. And... Well, we're a little bit frightened to make plans because the plans that we make, the things that we decide to do for the future, they, they don't always work out the way that we want to. And we think, oh no, things have gone, things have gone really badly wrong. And I wonder sometimes when, when we think things have gone badly wrong for us, do we think, oh, that means, that means God doesn't love me? Or do we think when things have gone badly wrong that it's always, always because things are out of control when you think about all that's happening in the world just now I wonder do you think is God in control well what I'm going to tell everybody today is from the story of Joseph that even though we make plans and we think our plans are good and even though sometimes not everything goes wrong there is a plan that works out in the end and it's God's plan I can think of many times that we've made plans, you've made plans, and the things don't happen the way we want it to. And what I want you to know, even though you might be young and you might have lots and lots of plans still to make, you've got plans to do things after this service is over, to go and play with something, you've got plans to see people soon and all sorts of things, but God's got a much bigger plan. And for us, the plan is that we will be together with Jesus at the end. That whatever happens, nothing's going to separate us from God's love. So I don't have a big long story to tell you. But I wonder when you think of all the plans that have been made. You think, mm, that didn't happen. I wasn't allowed to do that. Or we never got on holiday or we didn't go to school and all these plans. Well, God has a big plan. And it's going to happen. And that's what we see in the story of Joseph. I just want you to remember that. Will you remember that? God's plan is the plan that works out in the end. We're now going to pray together. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Bible reading is from Genesis chapter 37. And we're going to read the uh, part of the chapter after Joseph has been introduced. Jacob had 12 sons, one of them is Joseph. And I'm going to give you something from the story of Joseph today. Joseph 37 from verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to them, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flocks? They've moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the desert, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him off his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him in the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it's your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. May God bless his word to us. Does God have a plan for your life? If anybody's ever told you that God's got a plan for your life, I bet you they've told you the words from Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It sounds great. It sounds like we're all going to enjoy whatever God has for us in the immediate future. But what happens when things go wrong, when life gets hard, you have a bad day, week, month or year. Some people struggle with illness, physical and mental for decades, all their life. What is this plan that God has got and how is it going to come good in the end? Well, God does have a plan for you. God has a great plan for all of his children. What is God's plan? Well, it's more than a plan. He's decreed that it's going to happen, but we're going to become co-heirs with Christ. We're going to share in the blessings that Christ has been given. If indeed we share in his sufferings, says Paul, then we will also share in his glories. The way to enjoy this great plan 
to receive the blessings is often through hardship. What is your plan? And if I was to ask you to tell me your plan, what would it be? Some of us can't see much further than lunchtime. Others of you have got your whole life mapped out. And what we see looking at this story in Joseph is that it doesn't always come about the way we want to. If you think of Joseph's plan, he did he plan that his brothers would bow down before him? He, he told them that they would, but I, I don't know how he thought that would ever be worked out. I don't think he thought it would be worked out the way that it was worked out. It looked like Joseph was going to land on his feet because his dad had chosen him as the favourite and everything could have been organised so Joseph was the one. But it didn't quite work out the way that anybody would have expected. What we're thinking about today is that God is in control. And he's in control because he is sovereign and because he has his providence that he rules the world with. So there's two big words, sovereign like king, ruler, the one who decides and who's over everything, and God's providence, this idea, this thought that God decrees and rules what is going to happen according to his purposes and for his own glory. Things that we could never map out, but God makes happen and brings to pass what he wants to happen. Sometimes we question how all of these things will happen. My brother used to write me silly letters and I've kept them because they were rather silly. But one of the things he asked me one day was what about God's sovereign providence. He told it like this. Two bits of ply blew up and never hit me but flew over my head. That was lucky you may say. Not as lucky as John and Alan because they never even got nearly hit. Why did God in his sovereign providence nearly hit me twice with nine mil ply? Was it his way of saying, I could hurt you pretty bad if I wanted? Or was he saying, look how carefully I'm protecting you? Or was he just wanting to see the look in my face? Well, you can see there were silly letters when it's a bit of a silly question. And what I was being told is, we don't know the answer. What you're being told is, we don't know why lots of things happen. That's the lesson. We, we try and figure it out, but we can come to silly conclusions. They're wrong conclusions as to why God's let different things happen. What's happening in Joseph's life? What's the, the point of this story of this chosen son being th brutalised by his brothers, being thrown in a pit, being sold as a slave, becoming a servant to Potiphar and then being arrested and thrown in jail for something he didn't do, being freed as the interpreter of dreams, becoming the Prime Minister. What is the plan? Well we find out at the end that God meant it for good but we couldn't have seen that as we look at this story right now. What can we learn about God's plans then? Well I want to say that Nothing can get in the way of God's plans. Some of the things that we think could get in the way didn't get in the way of God's plans. Parenting. Joseph is, is sent by his dad Jacob to, to go and find his brothers. Now if we could speak to Jacob, we would say, Jacob, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? You were thinking it was a good idea to send the one that had riled his brother so much away 50 miles away to another place to go all on his own and look for his brothers. Could, could you not see that he, he riled them by everything that he did? Maybe Jacob was naive. Maybe Joseph himself thought that his brothers were going to love him. But if you think about it, it was a bit of a silly plan, wasn't it? It wasn't the, the best thing that he could have done. Jacob, he, he waves goodbye. He sees his son who's obviously old enough to make this journey and he says bye and he thinks, he thinks there's my, my favourite son going away, bye, bye. Never to see him again is what he's led to think just some weeks later. Never to see him for years, mourning, thinking that he's dead. This plan wasn't very good. What about Joseph himself? You know, it looks like Joseph could get in the way of of the plan of his brothers bowing down before him just by his own 
stupidity by his own naiveness again that he thinks it's it's a good idea to to rub his brother's nose in it by telling them that they'll bow down to it. Now, it doesn't mean that what his brothers did was in any way right, but Joseph managed to turn 11 of his brothers against him. Joseph managed to to sound big-headed in front of them. Joseph managed that they would actually want to kill him. That's that's pretty bad. And so, so Joseph himself might have been immature. We can't or couldn't see that God was in control in all that had happened. We can see that looking back. But it doesn't mean it was the wisest thing for Joseph to behave the way that he did. He didn't deserve that treatment, but his own contribution to the story looks like it got him into trouble. Then there's the hostility of his brothers. When they see him, they say, we want to kill him. This, this, this guy has riled us so much, we want to kill him. Then what will become of his dreams? We can say a wild animal has, has killed him and so, so we can just hand him over. And, and that will be the end of his dreams. That will be it over. And instead of becoming murderers, they become slave traffickers. But it's with their own brother, their own family, that they send him away. And, and, and they'll be thinking, that's the end of the story. That's the end of it. He, we will not bow down before him. We've won. Our plan has succeeded and his plan has come to nothing. I know somebody who I was quite close to and he was brought up in the church and he didn't like being brought up in the church. He, he kept on rebelling. When he lived at home as a youngish man, he, he went to church, but his other parts of his life were in no way Christian. And then eventually he moved away. And there was sadness because we knew that him moving away was him turning his back on all that he'd been brought up to know and to learn. He went away and lived with somebody, which was basically the ultimate that somebody uh, took them as a partner. And it was the ultimate rejection of of good that he'd been taught. A few months later, we heard he'd become a Christian. Running away, going away, God hadn't let go of him. The plan is, is not ours. The plan that wins out in the end is not ours. Now, I don't want anybody to think, hey, I'll run away from church and, and my Christian family and God will rescue me. I want you to, to discover now. I want you to come and see the best thing to do is to submit to God's plans as as best that you can and put your trust in God now. Don't run away. But don't think that you will win by running away. Don't think that your plan is the plan that is going to going to win out in the end. God's plans are the plans that win out in the end. What else can we learn about God's uh, plan? Well, we've seen mistakes and... and uh, other things don't get in the way of God's plan. Parenting, folly, stupidity, naivety, it doesn't get in the way of God's plan. Hatred doesn't get in the way of God's plan. Do you see that anywhere else? Do we know that is the way that the story goes? That nothing like that gets in the way of God's plan? You might see it in your own life, but you won't recognise it all the time. You won't know what good is going to come through it. So where do we go to see this plan that that is worked out, even though lots of people try to stop good from happening from it? Well, of course we see it in, in Jesus. We see it in the life of Jesus. We see it in Jesus coming to this earth. We see it in Je Jesus choosing for himself 12 close friends to be his followers, and one of them being Judas Iscariot. Jesus does no evil by choosing him, but in God's sovereign providence, this is the one who will betray him and hand him over to, to people who want to kill him and who eventually do kill him, who hang him on a cross, who make a mockery of him, who think that their plan has come to fruition and that the end of this troublemaker from Nazareth has been won. But no, God's plan is the plan that succeeds. God's plan is the one that comes to fruition. A plan to save even those who might crucify him. 
God's plan is in this, that it's through their evil, through their hatred, God works out his plan to rescue you and to rescue me, to, to bring us to trust in Jesus Christ, to completely fulfil his promise, to give his people a hope and a future, not through our immediate circumstances right now, but through what Jesus has done in dying for our sins and being raised to life, to ever live, to make intercession for us, to be the Saviour who will come back and get us. Have you responded to God's plan of salvation? Have you responded in the right way to it, by trusting it and not running away from it? Second main thing I want you to see is that good providences, good things that happen, don't always mean things are going to be easy. Do you remember as Joseph was walking along, he came to the place where his brothers were and they weren't there anymore. And just, you would say by chance, although it's not by chance, there was another man there and he'd heard that his brothers had moved on. Imagine you were lost and you discover somebody who knows where you can go. But the place that you go is a place where you weren't expecting it, but it becomes a place of danger, a place of destruction, a place where you're thrown in a pit and almost murdered. It, it doesn't always mean things are going to go well just because they're going well for a moment. Christians are, are, are very good at, at picking up the good things and seeing that, well, that's what God allowed to happen. But then we, we look forward and seeing that sometimes it's through these good things that we enter into more difficult times. Being loved by your father. Surely we can't say to anybody, don't love your children. Being loved by your father is a good thing. But it, it led to a problem for Joseph because he kept him back and he sent him later. And his brothers then treated him badly. It doesn't mean things are going to go easy. In a few hours, Joseph might more likely curse the man who sent him on his way to his brothers than be thankful that he did. And so, lots of the things in our lives, we, we want good to happen. Say we're single and we pray for a husband or a wife and God gives us a husband or a wife and then we spend most of our life caring for them because they might need it. Things can go wrong. We, we pray for children. God gives us children and through our children we might discover more pain and hardship than we ever knew before. Life can be like that. God and his sovereign providence can let that sort of thing happen and we're left scratching our heads going, God, what are you doing? Lots of us in following God's providences don't come to the easiest of times. Just think of the thousands and millions probably of Christians throughout the world who, who in God's providence come to put their hope and trust in Jesus. And immediately it means rejection from their family. Immediately it means they're threatened by violence. They, they can lose their jobs and livelihood. Because they become co-heirs with Christ because they've also shared in his suffering and they will share in his glory. But... Just because things go well doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. We need to we need to move on from that. We need to grow up a bit. We've been used to an easy Christianity, many of us, haven't we? It's not always easy. Good providences doesn't mean the next step is going to be the easiest step. But we're still stepping along in God's plan. We've got to remember who's writing the big story. That's, that's what we've got to remember, that we are being led towards an ending that is good. The third thing is that God doesn't always reveal his plan. At the end of the Joseph story, we get to Joseph telling his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He can see that at the end. And the thing about us is that we don't always know that. I may be doing Joseph a disservice but I wonder as he sat in the pit bleeding wondering what was going to happen next did he think God meant it for good did he think that this is all going to work out great for us 
Do you think that as he was sold for the price of a handicapped slave, that he thought, this is part of God's plan and I'm really happy and content with it? Do you think that as he ended up in prison because somebody lied about him, he thought, this is God's plan and I just got to got to live with it or did he did he pray that things would change did he did he seek God's help did he did he say that this is difficult and and he doesn't know what's going to happen do you think as he waved goodbye to his brothers well he probably didn't wave but as he thought of going away from his brothers in that caravan of traders that his dream that they would bow down to him did he think well that's the end of that them bow down to me more like me bow down to them did his faith get shaken when things got rocky Joseph knew at the end that God meant it for good he might not even have known the purpose of the whole story Stephen just before he is stoned to to death because he followed God's plan because he did what God wanted He said because the Patras were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from his troubles. We can see that looking back. It's because God was with him. What about Jacob, his dad? What was he thinking? He was sad for years. He said that he would go down to the grave with his son. He didn't have any hope. He uh, He refused to be comforted. But God's writing the big story. God's writing the whole story and we might go through times when we can't see how it's going to end well. And indeed it might get to the point where in this life it looks like it doesn't end well. When you think of death, it's never the happy ending, is it? It's not going to end well as we look at it from this side, when we see it our way. But Joseph... Joseph is an example to us. He's an example of what Christ would go through and be victorious. He he points forward to Christ in so many ways, but he also is just a lesson in himself. He's a lesson of what God would let his people go through and ultimately be victorious. Finally, I want you to see that although God reveals his plan, some reject it. We see this all through the Joseph story. He he reveals his plan that his brothers would would bow down to him and his brothers reject that. They didn't want the plan to come to fruition. They wanted something else to happen. They did all that they could to defy it. They rejected the plan. We live in a world where God has revealed his plan. God has revealed his plan that all who come to Jesus would be saved through him. And that if anybody doesn't come to Jesus to be saved by him through his death on the cross, that what would happen to them is that they would be punished eternally in hell. God has revealed this plan. What's happened is many people are rejecting it. Many people are saying, no, I have my own plan and God doesn't get a say in what happens. My plan is for me. I am not going to do what God wants. And we have to be very careful. You have to be very careful that you, as you hear God's revealed plan, that people would come and be saved through Jesus, through the one he has chosen. That even that people would bow down before him, because that's what God has revealed will happen. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God revealed this plan in his word. Don't be so foolish as to reject it. Because all that we do matters. Everything that we do matters. You might think very little matters. Does it matter what you had for breakfast this morning? Does it matter where you sit to watch this in your house? Well, lots of these things, you know, we don't see how they matter. And we don't know how they matter. And we might think, well, they don't really matter. But all of a sudden... Something matters. Something matters and God uses the choices that you make, the people that you talk to, the conversations you have. God uses them to work out his purposes. Can you see that? I mean, maybe you you have experience of that in your, your life. Maybe you think I'm talking nonsense right now, but it's not all just a big mistake. 
God has a plan. God has a plan, but the end of the plan is that his people would come to him, that nothing would separate them from his love, that all that happens in his people's lives would be for the good of those who love him. God has that plan. Do you trust it? Do you think that things are getting in the way of it and it's all going wrong? Well, it isn't. It isn't. It is coming to that fruition. And so I want you to know that. That whoever you are, whether you're the most important or the least important, that God can still be working out his plan. God is still working out his plan for you. So I don't want you to to go away from God. I want you to, to go to God and to submit to his plan. To submit to his plan and to see that it's the best plan. To see that all the plans that you have, admit it again, you're not really in control. The past few months for every single one of us have not gone to plan. But God has a plan that is going to work out for his good. For your good if you trust him. And you can trust him. Because he is in control. Does God have a plan for your life? Yes. If you're a Christian, he plans to make you a co-heir with Christ. He will do it. You just need to trust him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you do have a plan. A plan that is good. The best plan that there is. We thank you, Lord, for your plan to bring us salvation through your son, Jesus. Forgive us if so far we've been rejecting him and help us now today to come to him, to stop running away and to submit to the best plan that there is that we would be saved through Jesus Christ and we would have an eternal uh, salvation, being a co-heir with him, sharing in his glory. Lord, as Christians, we, we don't want to suffer. We naturally run away from trouble and conflict and hardship. Make us willing to, to suffer with Christ so that we would share in his glory, we pray. Lord, we ask today again that you'd bless the congregation in Dingle and Strathpeffer and then learn that you'd be with your people and that you would bless them and be with them. And if anybody has been going through hard times, wondering what your plan is, assure them today that your plan is good. And again, Lord, for those who who might want to run away, draw them to yourself. Watch over them and save them, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish by singing uh, praise or listening to praise. I'm not sure what you do, uh, whether you sing along, maybe some of you do. But what I want to listen to now is that hymn that's uh, been modernised by Colin Webster, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life? And to remember that we have an anchor that keeps the soul. That's from the book of Hebrews. We have an anchor and we can trust in God. So let's listen to Will Your Anchor Hold.
with the benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.